And well, wasn't there a Civil War song, The Vacant Chair? Oh, there we go. <laughs> hey, we are live. We are Chris live. Chris Anderson. Uh, what, what's the phrase again? Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Beyer in some place. In Chicago. And, yeah, and that's I right, just Chicago. And I, I just want to say to our guest who's standing by, don't be alarmed that you can't see yourself. That's because we've started the show while you were getting your tea, but we'll get back to you in a moment. So you're good. Don't go anywhere, Mark. Don't go anywhere, Mark. So, um, uh, uh, poof. Well, we're here. Welcome, everybody. We're back after uh, a, a week off. It seems like a year. Uh, and we'll be here wait, for wait, the wait, next... Wait, 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 wait. Oh, Chris! Yeah. I mean, it is you, Chris, or is it, it like your your son or something? Because that is a, you look yes. a lot younger with that haircut. Absolutely. Uh, and we are just waiting for a moment to, to for people to join us to get started. So post something to let us know that you're here. And we have a lot of people already coming in and posting on yeah. this Mother's Day. And Happy Mother's Day to those of you who are mothers and those of you who have a mother. To the rest of you. Text me. I'd like Happy. to know something about your life. Brian, thank you. Thank you for that news. I didn't know that Arsenal won. Thank you, Arsenal Brian. won today, so yeah, it's a good day deal. for Chris. And we see Xavier's here. And Xavier, I got the book that you sent me, so that is all good. Uh, and, um, yeah, and Chris, not only do you have a haircut, you've been prowling around London. I have been. We've been working on... Uh, doing some site inspection work for the Battle of Britain tour and um, a special operations executive tour that we've been developing. Fantastic. So find some great new sites, so that's exciting. Fantastic. Uh, and I do want to remind everybody that we are in the process over the next few weeks of transitioning the show away from the Stephen Ambrose Facebook and YouTube pages to our dedicated History Happy Hour Facebook and YouTube pages. And right now you can watch from both. It won't be true forever. We don't want history happy hour and chris anderson's new haircut to fall off your That's mental right. map so whether you're watching on facebook or youtube we want to make sure that you find the new page and like it or subscribe or whatever so that you can keep watching us uh once we've completely moved over and we'll keep sending out notices and bothering you all to hell and gone about that for the next like, few oh weeks my God, another, yeah, yeah, i know yeah. so uh, chris what do you think are we just about ready to get started here i think we are uh give us the cue the bar is open the bar is open i had to find the bell i was like oh my god the bell where is that <laughs> so so happy uh assisted happy mother's day happy mother's and day happy, to Anna. happy ve day plus one also, do you know about the connection between Mother's Day and the Civil War? No, but I know you're the person to tell me. That. Yeah, because so the holiday kind of got its start in 1868 when Ann Jarvis organized a committee to establish a Mother's Friendship Day to reunite families that had been divided during the Civil War. So it didn't actually become a national holiday until 1913 when eventually uh, Ann Jarvis's daughter, Anna Jarvis, uh, taking up her mother's cause, made it a holiday. So that's one Civil War connection with the day. And guilted children for time immemorial after that. And, and, then, and then Frank Hallmark got involved. Yeah, and that, uh, I'm yeah. just making that Imagine part just up. happens. I know, I know. And then the other thing, Chris, I have a quiz for you today because oh. I, know, I know how much you like them. Uh, and let me just get my, my screen here. Uh, do you know whose birthday it is today? It is the birthday of a Civil War figure today. Did he have a long beard? At some times in his life he did, but that is everybody in the Civil War. That's right. <laughs> did he have a top hat? <laughs> did he wear a dark suit and uh, yes. sort of pose like this? Yeah, you're on it. Okay. Yeah, I can show you his picture. Okay. Maybe you'll identify him from his picture. John Wilkes Booth. No, John Brown. John Brown, born this day in 1800 in Connecticut. I didn't know. Well, you know, Rick, technically he was dead before the Civil War, so it was kind of wrong to tell me that it was a Civil War figure. Wasn't but it? his soul goes marching on. That's true. Oh, okay. Best song. Awesome song. Okay. Um, okay, so clearly this is the day to talk about the Civil War. <laughs> we have a lot of good cues there, uh, and so we're going to. Uh, in April of 1862, a U.S. Navy fleet under the command of Admiral David Farragut, 
who one day would be damming the torpedoes in Mobile Bay, uh, fought its way up the Mississippi and captured the largest city and busiest port of the Confederacy, New Orleans. And, you know, when we talk about the Civil War, we tend to give uh, a lot of attention to famous battles like Gettysburg and Vicksburg and New Orleans, not so much. Not so much. Yet the fall of New Orleans was a critical turning point in the Civil War and kind of an early harbinger of, of, uh, of Confederate defeat. And to talk about that today, we've invited somebody we both know well, uh, historian and author Mark Bielski, who's going to join us on the show. Hey, Mark. Hey. Hey. Mark hey. Good to there. see you all. Yeah, we've, we've had endless audio trouble with Mark, so it's great to hear Mark. Uh, yeah, here. I mean, it's great to see you all because... Uh, you, you both of we've all worked together before, yes. and it's just, it's just fun just to be together again. Yeah, Mark, absolutely. You look about a year older. What? It has been a year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to say that Mark is the author of a new book that's just come out, uh, A Mortal Blow to the Confederacy, The Fall of New Orleans in 1862. And I'm, I, so I imagine some of you guys know Mark as well from his trips at Stephen Ambrose Tours. And he has a Ph.D. in history from the University of Birmingham in England. And that is the right way to say that. And he also hosts the History with Mark Bielski podcast. Thank God somebody else doesn't host the History with Mark yeah. Bielski podcast. <laughs> no wondering. Because that would be an issue, Mark. So, right. Mark, Mark I, I, I know you're drinking tea, but Chris, did you, did you bring a cocktail today? I did, I did. Okay, so we can celebrate Arsenal's victory uh, with on. tea and beer yeah. and, and whatever we have. Well, here... here. Look, can I tell y'all something? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's what you're I here for. My Jefferson Davis cup. I'm not oh. saying this isn't going to be reflected in a slight bias in your telling Ooh, of the story. Oh, it? it's trouble from oh, the yeah, beginning absolutely. of the show. Trouble from the beginning of the show. <laughs> the Jefferson Davis yeah, I, cup. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I always like to be controversial. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Chris knows that. No, uh, I would never heard of that before. I, I, I just, you know, if we're going to stir things up, that's just the way it's going to go. Okay. So, Mark, um, you write in the book that Admiral David Dixon Porter, who also played a crucial role in, in this and many other Civil War naval battles, that Porter ranked the fall of New Orleans as the most important event of the Civil War. So why was it important and why don't we spend more time talking about it? Well, because uh, Porter was uh, actually he was not an admiral at that time. He was a commander, but he was very influential. And uh, the reason we don't spend time talking about it because everybody was so concentrated on Gettysburg and Vicksburg that they forgot all about you know the biggest city in the South. So what? But what? What is it then that really makes this so important? Why? Why is New Orleans? I mean, New Orleans is a long way from Richmond. It's a long way from a lot of places. Why is it even important to the Confederacy? Well, if you have the biggest financial center and shipping center, the there, there was New Orleans was the largest shipping center in the world at that time. Um. If you have, if you want to hold on to that, just like I wrote in the uh, in my book, like if you have New York, why would you give that up? Right. Well, you actually had this great um, uh, uh, comparison uh, at the beginning of the book. Since it's the beginning of the book, you can tell people about it. That won't prevent them from buying the book. But um, uh, about sort of saying, what if it was New York during World War II? You want to run us through that? Well, I I do because if 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 it was had it been New York during World War II, um, and we had a fleet of enemy ships, let's say Nazi Germany approaching New York, don't you think that uh, uh, not you, Rick or or Chris, but don't you think that it would be important to defend the? Uh, the biggest port, biggest city. Uh, the Confederacy was a new new country at that time, and um, New Orleans had, had was a bigger city than if you put 
Charleston, Richmond, Memphis, and Savannah together, hmm. New Orleans was still bigger and economically a lot more important. So, so Mark, in the book, you have this great quote from Lincoln saying that the Mississippi is the backbone of the rebellion. Um, clearly, lots of people up north saw New Orleans as important. You see New Orleans as important. But in reading your book, I get the impression that nobody in the Confederate high commander cabinet <laughs> thought New Orleans was that important. So I'm wondering, yeah, yeah, why, right. how did they let that one fly by them? Because... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Chris, um, it's an amazing um, uh, thing that they did. Everybody thought that the anything any threat to New Orleans was to come from upriver, come right. downriver. And um, one of the one of the great strategies that the uh, Union put together is when they gave Farragut command and just sent him and uh, complete command and they just sent him and he said he knew New Orleans because he was he grew up here basically and he said we're going to go up through the Mississippi River now the key if I may point this out you're the author of course you may <laughs> okay Okay. I don't know. Can we take uh, a vote? <laughs> I don't know. Should he really be allowed to point this out? I mean, well, better him than me. All right. Point, <laughs> whatever it is, point it out. Uh, in the War of 1812, the British did not come up the Mississippi River. You know why? You're going to tell me. Um, because they were under completely under sail. Right. So they had to come in from the east. Oh, okay. And uh, when Farragut brought his navy up, they were under steam and sail. Right. So if you can steam by the forts while you're getting shelled, you got a better chance of getting up river. But, but again, because Mark, if, the, go ahead. No, because well, if if. These guys knew they'd seen steamships, and there have been sightings of the Union fleet at the mouth of the Mississippi right after the South seceded. I just am amazed that nobody in Davis's cabinet said, you know, geez, just in case. <laughs> it, they, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, we've all been scratching our heads about that. They, um, the... Uh, um, it's amazing that the uh, the Confederate cabinet at that time, what, besides Jeff Davis, who was from southwestern Mississippi, as Chris, you know, you went to school in the South, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Stephen Mallory, who was from Florida, who would know this area. He was the Secretary of the Navy, right? Yes. Yes. For the Confederacy, right, and um, and Judah Benjamin, who was from Louisiana, South right. Louisiana, you would think that they would have some kind of inkling that. Yeah, you're not yeah. making him look any better, Mark. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm trying. I'm trying my best, but. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but they really did. So, so. Um, and we should explain, and, and um, I don't have a map to put right here. I probably should have gotten that map, but uh, but Okay, here's, here's, here's a basic one. It doesn't matter. Mississippi's a really long river. Right. It starts... It's a very... Uh, way up north. Starts yeah. up Way here, out at the bottom. It goes down at the bottom. There's a All the way to New Orleans. Orleans. Right. That's right. Well, and then below go. New Orleans, you have about 70 miles of river. Right? right. So so either people can can come to New Orleans coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, up that 70 miles of river, which is narrow and goes like this, and get to New Orleans, which is why the Confederates think they can defend it. Or they can come down from um, Vicksburg, or you know, they can come down from Minneapolis they were if they want up to. But more, more north of Memphis, actually, okay. at that time. 
So people, the the Confederate, uh, the 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 genius Confederate uh, high command thinks that 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 is meant to be a ah, knock. Please. They think it's going to come from the north when in fact yeah. the genius Union command decides to come up from the south. So that's like that's step one of um, kind of hit them where they ain't, I guess. Uh, it, that's a great way to put it. Because remember, Farragut, even though he was born in East Tennessee, he grew up in New Orleans. And he knew all the waters here. Uh, not only in Mississippi, but the Gulf of Mexico, because he had grown up sailing here. So um, he knew, like, if we could sail past the forts, Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip, and get by the guns, we're home free. Because all you got to do is get by the guns at the forts, and then you you're up at the at the city. They get to the city, and um, Mansfield Lovell, who is in command. Oh, excellent. Um, That's Mansfield Lovell. Right. I'm on. See, I, we're listening to you, Mark. We're hanging on every word. We're, okay. <laughs> um, he he knew that if he if he made New Orleans a uh, military target, that it would be in in deep peril. And we had a lot of um, international people here, uh, plus of course women and children. And he didn't want to he didn't want to uh, put them in danger, so he pulled all the troops out plus strategically or tactically um, he wanted to get all the all the confederate equipment out what they had left so he left and then the union ships came up and It was a pretty easy surrender. Right. So, so the real battle is is down down river, right at Fort exactly. Jackson and Fort. At Phillip. the Fort. Yeah. Or, am I interrupting you, Chris? Did you no, your poise say, for so the question? As you know, throughout the book, you talk about poor Lovell, like what few troops he have has gets stripped. They get sent up north. Stripped, sent up north. You talk about um, a Confederate naval commander named Hollins, who's actually competent, which seems to be a rarity amongst the Confederate command. So what is actually happening up north of New Orleans that's causing them to divert all of these resources? Oh, that's a good question. Up north. Um, it, it was just, uh, Richmond was making all the decisions because you, right. couldn't, you couldn't make a decision down here, right. like Lovell, for example, without going through Richmond. Right. You had to do anything. So he had to keep transferring troops up north, up to Tennessee, to Albert Sidney Johnston, and to Army of Northern Virginia. It wasn't really the Army of Northern Virginia yet, but you know, up right. in that in so it Virginia. Was, it was just a general call to send troops there. Well, there wasn't like an right. army coming down yet. All the guys from up up here were transferred up north. Okay. And the only people that Lovell had here were, um, you know, young trainees, and they were working with broomsticks uh, to instead of guns. Yeah, they're not very effective. No. Uh, they were training, you know, and they, their morale was very low. You know, so, so man, look, uh, Mark, I think... <clears throat> People who know about the Civil War, they know the names of a lot of commanders. I'm not going to list them. I don't think Mansfield Lovell is a very commonly known person. And uh, uh, he, is he, you know, I think you write about this. He, he gets a lot of blame for the Union capture of New Orleans. Is it appropriate? Well, he, he does because I know you are going to be surprised about this. Okay. 
but uh, Jefferson Davis deflected all the blame for the loss in New Orleans. No, a politician. To <laughs> rubble. That could never happen today. Oh no, never, no, no. <laughs> No, they're good. Thank goodness history, you know, doesn't teach us any lessons for today. <laughs> right. And he immediately he me, immediately asked for a uh, a hearing. Um, and it took him a year to get that. And he finally got that, and he he was. Uh, and actually, Robert E. Lee was the one who insisted that he get his. Um, fair hearing and three years he, after we got railroaded out <laughs> yeah. almost, almost. Yeah. no it was almost it was uh yeah almost and um and then he got uh completely exonerated but all the all the uh, historians newspapers and everything until 1860 uh, 1961 Blame him for losing the city. Oh, so he's only blamed for the first hundred years. <laughs> That's not so bad. Yeah. Now whose fault is it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, uh, let, let's talk. We, we talked a little bit about uh, Mansfield Lovell. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Admiral Farragut and Admiral uh, Porter. And um, you mentioned you corrected me. Thanks so much. Uh, that uh, that Porter was not an admiral at the time, but he did become one. Darn it! In fact, right, he right. he he and Farragut were the two first two full admirals, uh, I believe, in in the U.S. Navy, uh, and they're both kind of Civil War heroes. We've got Porter on the left and and Farragut on the right, <clears throat> but they've got an interesting and complicated relationship, right? Because they're actually adopted brothers. They grew up in the same household, but Porter's also busy throughout this battle like he helps Farragut get the command job but then he's busy trying to undermine him it's a kind of a weird story it 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 really is because uh, they were foster brothers and um, Porter just seemed to work to undermine Farragut the whole time after getting him the job basically yeah yeah he recommended him as as the story goes I of course, I wasn't there in New York. Oh, don't be the, modest. When the decision was made. But um, Porter just like worked to undermine him. But what he did, he, he was very effective, if I may add this. He, he manned the um, mortar fleet that shelled the forts. Uh, Fort Jackson and Philip and St. Philip. And he did a great job with that. Um, which enabled which enabled Porter to get his gunboats up past Parody, the yeah. yeah, past there. But they they weren't you would think that, that two foster brothers would, would work uh, very well together, but they didn't. Did Farragut have any idea that that Porter is that that Porter's under his command. He's my younger foster brother. He's under my command. Um, kind of like the relationship I have with Chris, where I'm his Sorry, younger brother. foster brother and I'm <laughs> under his command. <laughs> and, right, and, yeah. and and does he have any idea that his younger foster brother is meantime writing letters back to Washington saying, "Oh." Look! Look at how terrible Farragut is doing. I'm I'm not sure he's the right person for this. Does Farragut have any idea, or does he eventually find out? Of course he did, because all all the all the uh, officers had intelligence. I don't mean intelligence like up here, but <laughs> yeah, not all but, officers have that kind of intelligence. But they yeah, right. got it, got it. But 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 uh, other officers who would check on things. So he knew about Porter. So did that make family reunions a little awkward? <laughs> oh, it was terrible after the war. Oh, was it? Really? Seriously? Oh, yeah. They had like a like a big brouhaha when they got together for uh, Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, Batanga. All right. So 
Mark, you know, one of the things that I think comes through in the book pretty clearly is um, it would be safe to say that the Confederate command uh, was a little bit dysfunctional and that Lovell really didn't command much of anything because he had a, you know, he had to ask Richmond to do everything. He had no command over the naval troops. The Confederate Navy troops didn't have command over Louisiana Navy troops, and it all gets very confusing. Um, that seems to me to be a problem that's inherent in the Confederacy throughout the war, right? They need, you, you mentioned unity of command. Right. And there is no unity of command. So is, no. this, is this just kind of a reflection of the Confederacy's problem anyway? Throughout? Or, yeah. Yes. I would say so. Go on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would say that um, the the key was, and and I think I mentioned this, well, I I know I mentioned this, is one thing is Farragut got complete control, kind of like Eisenhower did in World War II. Right. Um, Farragut had complete command over any naval vessels, land troops, whatever. And as 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 Chris, as you pointed out, um, Lovell had to go through Richmond to get a gunboat to move, right? Uh, or anything that happened with the on the river fleet. And uh, and to ask for more troops, which is difficult for. Them. So, um, <clears throat> you're, you're look. Are you still there with us, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. You were yeah. looked like you were freezing up there for a moment, but you're good. So, I we have a question from one of our viewers, and and I, you may not know the answer, but I'm going to put it out there for you anyway. Um, so it's okay. It's okay either way. But uh, Xavier is uh, is in Spain, and Xavier mentions that Farragut's family was from, uh, I guess originally from the Balearic Islands. I'm probably saying that wrong in Spain. <clears throat> I thought he was from Glasgow. That was what I or, or from, you know I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you know if he spoke Spanish? Um, and uh, he mentions also that General Meade was born in Spain. Is is that? That that is that is not in my knowledge base. So, uh, do you have well, anything to Ge- share? General on this? Meade actually was born in Spain. Wow, um, I did not know that. And thank you, um, Xavier. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was. Uh, I think his family was am- ambassadors. Yeah, and of course, he he was American. And after Gettysburg, Spain claimed America for their own. Um. Yeah. Okay. No, I want to. I want to hear what your reaction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm thinking there's something in the T. Is what I'm thinking of. Uh, so okay. So Meade was born in Cadiz. His father was a uh, U.S. ambassador. I, I'm sorry that just escaped me. I always think of George Meade, the Pennsylvanians, uh, the, the old yeah. snapping turtle. You know all that stuff. I just did not realize he was born in right. Spain. Uh, I'm only, I don't know. I yeah. don't know about uh, Farragut. About Far no Farragut was born in East Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. And then he moved down here and he he grew up here. Okay. So, but maybe I don't know anything about his his family. And but but I I know that Xavier is um, is is uh, often right. So you know we we give him his creds. We give him his creds. I'd be um, glad to look it up. Well, yes, but not now. No, but not now. We need you here now. You know, the thing is that we have, you know, maybe a hundred people watching, and I bet they all have Google. So the information, <laughs> the information is going to appear somehow in the chat area pretty soon. Um, I, I want to uh, 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 switch uh, gears a little bit here uh, in this. Battle. Chris, is it my turn? I'm sorry. You know, I'm losing yeah, I track. I think it's your turn. Okay. I think it's your turn. Just checking here. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk. Uh, so this is a, the big battle here is a naval battle. Uh, right. The battle for New Orleans, and it takes place down uh, around the area of Fort uh, Jackson and Fort Saint Philip, about sixty miles or so south of uh, New Orleans, along the Winding River, depending on how you measure. 
and uh, David Farragut is bringing the fleet up, uh, the Union fleet, and the Confederates have a lot of um, uh, hope invested in some newfangled ironclads. This is about a month after the Battle of the uh, Monitor and the Merrimack in Virginia, and the Confederates have built, they've completed one ironclad, the Manassas, uh, and they have two others, that's the Manassas there, they have two others under construction, and they're really hoping that these are going to be uh, the big, uh, you know, the Davids that are going to beat Goliath. So, so what happened, what, tell us about those, those ships and, and, uh, and what happens there. Okay, well, they were actually building what you're looking at there, the Manassas, is really a small ironclad that did quite a bit of damage downriver. But the two boats that they were uh, putting their hopes on were the Louisiana and the Mississippi. And um, they were like the super ironclads. And really big, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, in, I have to say this, in, in true um, Southern fashion, they didn't get either one completely finished. <laughs> There was a strike on one, right? The the, right, the, the right. Louisiana, I think. I don't, I don't remember which one, but the carpenters go on right. strike. They, they, like, Do you not know that time might be important here? Yeah, I'm just going to make a suggestion that the <laughs> next time the South secedes, maybe they ought to wrap some of this stuff up before they do they secede. Oh, oh, after. Just, okay. just saying. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. Chris, no sedition advice right. from you, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, where where are you at in England? How did they do in the American Revolution? Careful, Mark. Careful. careful. I'm Rick. I'm Rick. Chris. No, was, yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you let it kill? But Mark, Mark, actually, Chris, Chris, you know that uh, my, my professor in England told me that the, how much time they spent on the American Revolution. What, like thirty minutes? Ten. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> until they needed lend lease, and then they uh, all they all, all they own. needed to say was and they won, we suck, and uh, <laughs> and that was the, all they needed to teach the at uh, at Old Brum there about the revolution. No, it's basically we withdrew. We withdrew. <laughs> We're back to the ironclads, however. Okay, yeah, back uh, to the, the two super ships, the Louisiana and Mississippi. Well, they never got them completed. They moved the Louisiana down. Uh, to the forts to be at least part of a force against the oncoming Union fleet. And all it could do is moor up against the riverbank and uh, fire off the guns off its uh, port bow. I mean, that's not an effective war gunboat. No, and then eventually the... the the Louisiana is, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the captain of the Louisiana is a great character in your book because he, or not the captain, but the commander of the, the naval fleet, yeah. Mitchell, Mitchell, he's, he's really uh, screwing a lot of things up. But this is the, the end of the Louisiana, so you know it doesn't end well uh, as it's, uh, it's basically set on fire, floated downstream, and eventually explodes. But we have a question from one of our, uh, our our viewers, James Lynn, and I know James lives in uh, uh, New Orleans, and he's a historian as well. And he asks the question, uh, sort of the alternative history question: If the ironclads Louisiana and Mississippi had been one hundred percent completed, would they have made any difference in the surrender of New Orleans? They absolutely would have. Uh, the Union commanders Farragut and um, Everybody in the Union uh, Navy said if they had gotten those gunboats in action, they would have completely controlled, the Confederates would have completely controlled the Gulf and the lower Mississippi River. So this is probably why the, you know, in, in the South there's a lot of, I'm, I'm really going out on a limb here, Chris, uh, uh, anti-Union sentiment. It's because of that strike that prevented... <laughs> <laughs> the completion of the boat that would have changed the course of the war. 
Mm. Well, no, because I think given how screwed up the Confederate, Mark can comment on this, but given how screwed up the Confederate High Command was, they could have had the USS Texas from World War II parked in the Gulf of Mexico, and the commanders still wouldn't have been able to get the job done because Lovell couldn't have gotten permission to move the ship to... Sh- it's uh, you mean from Richmond? Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I, wanna, I do want to go back just briefly to the Manassas just because I found the story of the Manassas quite fascinating, um, uh, and, and we don't have to go into detail in it, but just they built this small ironclad. It goes into action actually earlier than, than this Battle of New Orleans at the earlier Head of the Passes right. battle, uh, which is really before the Monitor and Merrimack, I think, or at least uh, around the same time as it. it. It's pretty successful, and it scares the living daylights out of the... Chris, Chris, wake up. It Sorry. scares the living no, daylights. Yeah, <laughs> studying his notes. I just want to make sure you're still with us. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm just, just, if I see this, I'm nervous. I get nervous. I don't want to have to finish the show without you and then have to call your house and say, go upstairs and check on him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, getting uh, back to the okay. Manassas. <laughs> okay. But anyway, getting back to the Manassas, it's... Um, uh, it, 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 they're scared, really scared about it. They call it uh, something like a, a, a hellacious machine or something like that, a hellish machine. And even when it, it is abandoned and, and it is left as a derelict and floats downstream, it's still scaring the Union Navy, even then. Right. Well, the, the Manassas was actually... Um, was very effective because when the first... when the uh, first Union ships came into the mouth of Mississippi. Uh, the Confederates at that time had a very good commander in uh, Commodore Hollins, who grew up on the Chesapeake Bay, and he actually knew what he was doing. And when he um, saw the conf- uh, the the Union ships coming up the river, he put his troops in action, especially the Manassas, and he figured we're just going to go full steam ahead and hit them. Um, it's, you know, the, the old thing, the best defense is a good offense. And that's what he did, and he won that first battle at the passes. Um, so, but then, Mark, in, in true you know, Confederate fashion, Holland actually wins this victory, lifts everybody's right. morale. He's got control of the situation, but then they send him north. Does he, like, is he ordered north or what? So he's... Yeah, he's I knew you were going there. I, of course I was. <laughs> <laughs> no one answers. No one answers. <laughs> they, because you know what he did? No. He, he um, went over command and just took things on his own shoulders and then they they sent they you know what they they sent him to richmond for a desk job that makes all the sense in the world oh yeah yeah <laughs> so they sent their best naval guy up north to richmond where you ain't going to do much Not a lot fighting of water in the navy richmond, there yeah, no. i'm just thinking yeah. this confederacy was never destined to succeed <laughs> I think it had some fundamental oh, flaws. I've just, I would, <laughs> I'm just coming to realize this. Uh, no, that's just that softball is just hanging there, Rick. I can't. <laughs> so, Mark, what are the other? I mean, we shouldn't. All, all kidding aside, we've been talking a lot about the naval component of it, and that's why we probably remember it. Some of these amazing ships, and I know it's like a, I don't know, steampunk sort of TV or whatever, but, but. <laughs> What's going on on the land side? Because obviously there are there land engagements. Um, is the Union Army doing anything, or is this purely a naval? Well, the, the Union Army was coming up by ship, because if you think of it, I, I mean, both y'all have been down here. You know, there's not a, a lot of land access to New Orleans coming up from the mouth of the river. Right. So they they were coming up by ship. And that's where, uh, in, in the book, I talk about how they sent the uh, brigade down to, um, it's, it's not even there anymore, to the landing to 
stop any advance of Union troops moving. In quarantine? Up. Yeah, quarantine. And um, the river at that time of year is uh, about as high as the levee goes. Um, and if you if you think about it, um, you have to you'd have to see it. But the river is as high as the levee is. So any guns pointed at any any guys on the shore would be at eye level. So they had to surrender, and you know that was the end at quarantine, and then. You know, Butler just Butler came a, a, ashore with his troops. General uh, Butler. Yeah, Benjamin Butler. There you go. With his troops, and you know, they just started the occupation. It, I I, I want to say I want to come back to to General Butler, who I think is the spitting image of Dennis Franz. Do you remember from Hill Street Blues? I always thought if they ever did a movie about. <laughs> This, they should, I they never have. thought. I never thought about it. So now it's going to be like that. Song. I mean, Mark, it's identical. I mean, does Mark's anybody? Not be able to get that out of his head now. I didn't. I didn't pull a picture of Dennis Franz, but go look up one day after <laughs> from Hill Street Blues. It, it is could be the same person. It could be you know, an impersonator. But I want to go back, Mark. I want to kind of take a comment you made and, and go back to Fort uh, Jackson and and Saint Philip. And as we said, they're like sixty miles south of. New Orleans, you can see here on the map, they're on each side of the river. Farragut's got to get up between them, which he eventually does. They they blast the forts with mortars. They break the chain. There's various, it's a nighttime action, which is which sort of seems to happen a lot in naval battles in the Civil War, not so much in land battles. And then... Um, uh, and then they move on to New Orleans, but but Fort Jackson and and Fort Saint Philip are still there today. And we we were down. Uh, I think you were there with us uh, down at Fort Saint Jackson a few years ago for the uh, Ambrose uh, Stephen Ambrose seminar down there. And so you can see some of the the casemates here, and you do get a sense here of how low lying these forts are. When you look at the at the ship there on the Mississippi River, it almost looks like it's above the fort. Um, you know they're they're pretty down low. So what I was going to ask you about is, um, you know, what's these are these are kind of monuments to history and to the battle. They weren't particularly effective, but they are still there. How easy are they, or how hard are they to visit these days? Because the the water's rising, right? This is a this is not an area that it's easy to get to down in Plaquemines Parish. Well, this. Uh, this time of year, just like that photo you just showed, uh, that's how it would have been back in the in the war in April, where that the gunboats would have been at at almost eye level. Um, you can visit Fort Jackson, and there's the um, Fort Jackson Museum there. Uh, Fort St. Philip, uh, it's really not much access. And they, when, we, when we were there a, a few years ago, though, it was even then it was was open by appointment, but but the, there'd been a lot of hurricane damage down in that area. And there was some questions whether they were going to keep letting people down there, but they still are. Yes, yes. Okay. And there, um, I think when when you were there, did we have the. Uh, the uh, Plaquemines Chamber yeah. come and visit us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, they were raising money. They were trying to get money to 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 keep things restored and stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I had a lot of sympathy for the um, the poor Union soldiers that were in that campaign because when we went down to the fort, um, my first time there, and I was learning all this great new stuff, and I started walking around the fort, and as I am wont to do, I left the group and. One of the Plaquemines Parish people came running over to him and said, "Don't go down there. The alligators are down there." I was like, "What?" <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, we, we almost we almost lost. I, I wondered why did. you weren't in any of the pictures. You know, I was <laughs> looking right. for you, and uh, I couldn't find you in any of the, any of the pictures there. Yes. Um, but but so so okay. So we dealt with with Forts Jackson and and Saint Philip. But then we I, we do have to come back to to, to Dennis France. 
excuse me, to uh, Benjamin Butler. He uh, is a politician. I think he's originally from Massachusetts. Right. Uh, he's a politician who made a general, and then he becomes the military governor of New Orleans, where everybody just loves and respects him. Right? Is that? Do I have that right? I think. Are you just... kidding? <laughs> <laughs> he's just misunderstood. He's just missing his nickname. He's got two nicknames, Spoons for his greediness and Beast for his actions. Right. But tell us a little bit about why well, uh, Benjamin Butler is so hated in New Orleans, probably still today. Well, of course. You can still go to the French Quarter and buy um, uh, dishes that uh, like bedpans that have his image in it. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, to this day. Not that we would not that we hold you know, a grudge. We remember things here. You hold a grudge, okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, he uh, two things. Um, he was terrible, and if you, if you in the in the book, um, one of the things that the Union officers did, the senior officers did, is they came into the French Quarter. And they would commandeer houses, not French Quarter, more the Garden District, commandeer houses and take furniture and move it around as they saw fit. Mm -hmm. um, Butler did a couple different things. He decided on the good side, which you never hear anybody talk about him on the good side. He said, I want to clean up this city. And he said, the first thing to do is we're going to clean up the French market, which hadn't been, um, which is down on the Mississippi River. You, I, both of you all know where that is. Yeah, yeah. But um, so he got fire hydrants opened and he just washed it completely out. And then he said, the good thing about New Orleans is it rains a lot. So it'll be very helpful in cleaning up. And then he put a, a he put, this is pro kind of early for back then. He, he said it's illegal to litter. Wow. So, so, and so. he said that uh, anybody who litters is subject to jail. And one guy um, deliberately went out and dropped a piece of paper out on the road, on the mm -hmm. sidewalk, and was arrested and sent to um, either Ship Island or, or, or Fort Jackson because he made them both prison camps. So, so he did some good things. So what you're saying then, Mark, is it took somebody from up north to come down there and show you how to run your city. That's they... <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's on the positive side of the ledger for for Benjamin Butler. What's on oh, the negative side? Chris, I, I think... didn't. I didn't. I was waiting for that. We're moving right along, guys. What's on the negative side? He, he does a couple About of Butler? things. Yeah, he does a couple of things that really, uh, really. Uh, of anger, New Orleans. Uh, his well, his he, order he, about he, women, for example. Yeah, the women's order, where he any any woman who insulted a uh, Union officer or soldier was subject to imprisonment, and and would be treated like a a woman, a of, woman the town of the town plying her wares. Right, and which that doesn't mean like, like Tupperware, a, right? Which means a pro, no, right. not Tupperware. We didn't have that back then. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, which uh, means a prostitute, I, right? Yeah, yeah. I was waiting for you to say that. Thank you. So, so he's gonna. So, this is an order where he says that if women aren't respectful to union officers, we get to treat you like prostitutes, and it's for some reason this bothers well, New Orleans, right? Because they would, they would. Uh, <clears throat> there were there were ladies who would insult or spit on union officers or soldiers when we were occupied. And even dump uh, bedpans on them, um, and then uh, that's when he he drew the line. 
Well, you know, I just you know, reading your book, I was made aware of the fact that New Orleans was part of a state that was in rebellion against the government, right? So I, I, I've always had a kind of a hard time with New Orleans claiming that they were being ill-treated when they kind of seceded from the Union and they were trying to maintain martial law. I mean, what 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 could Butler have? What what should Butler have done? <laughs> Left. <laughs> Left. Well, I'm sure a lot of his soldiers felt the same way. But oh, you know, if yeah. you had <laughs> go back up north. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, perfect. Solution. No, he was. You know, he was actually Chris. Um, he was sent down here. First of all, he was in the. Nobody liked him up in Washington. Well, he was true. on the peninsula in Virginia, and they hated him there. Although he did come up with the uh, the uh, contraband law right. that captured slaves were contraband of war, and then uh, but he was terrible as a, a, a military commander. They couldn't wait to get him out of Virginia, away from Washington. And they said that, well, where do we send him? And they said, uh, the, un the Union uh, command said, Ship Island, Mississippi. Which is basically uh, nowhere. Ten miles. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, Twelve that's miles. Nice, south. Twelve miles off the, the coast. The, the that's coast, like the end of yeah. stripes when they get sent to a weather station in Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, <laughs> except it's a lot hotter. A there. lot of hotter. <laughs> yeah. So they sent him there, and then little did he know, all of a sudden a lot of troops were coming in to his force because of the invasion that he, they didn't tell him about. Because the only person who knew about it was Farragut. It was one of the great operations that no one, that was kept secret. When they, when they decided to put Farragut in charge and do that operation, right. nobody said a word. And it was amazing how that whole fleet came, if you think about it, that whole fleet come from, came from New York and down around the Florida coast, and right. nobody knew about it. Yeah, so the, the Confederacy didn't have coast watchers. I think that was another ah, lesson they were, learned. They're terrible. <laughs> they were um, you know, Mark. Um, uh, uh, sometimes it seems like we're still fighting the Civil War, uh, 160 years later. Oh, get out of here! And, and there's definitely a contentious battle about how we talk and remember the Civil War, uh, how we talk about it and remember it. So, you know, what do you think, as, as we're wrapping up here, what do you think should be our, our takeaway from this time in history, from not just from the, the Battle of New Orleans that you've written about, the fall of New Orleans, but about, about the Civil War as we look back on it 160 plus years later? Well, in, in, in all honesty, um, I think we can't look at uh, what went on back then, the way we look at things now. Um, we have to, uh, and, and, and we have to, the other thing is, we have to look at the, at the actual soldiers who fought on either side and think, what were they doing? What were they in there? So give them all credit for, you know, fighting for what they believed. I don't know if I, I don't know if that, I made that clear, but, you know. You, you danced Chris, around that very well, Mark. What? No. What? Go ahead. Chris, you know, from going to school in Farmville, right. um, you know, a, a statue of a Confederate soldier in the town square is that that guy, that kid, most likely, was just there to defend his home um, from invasion. And um, 
and Rick, you know, some of the some of the guys from up north, the young kids, they were just going down there because, well, um, I reckon we got to pre preserve the union, or because they were drafted. Yeah, or drafted exactly. Same on the southern side. Sometimes after '62, but uh, you can't condemn the 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 soldiers. So, so Mark, then when I start to pass the hat on the next Ambrose tour to put up statues to all the brave loyalist soldiers who helped defend their country during the American Revolution, you're I'm in there. All right, good. <laughs> you, you heard it on next history, on History Happy Hour. You Chris's heard it new on campaign. History Happy Hour, right? I can see a new cause that Chris Anderson is undertaking. Mark Bielski, thank you so much for joining us today Thanks, on History Happy Hour to talk about. Uh, the Fall of New Orleans in 1862, and a reminder that Mark's new book is A Mortal Blow to the Confederacy, The Fall of New Orleans, 1862, and you can also check out his podcast. We had somebody say that they missed your podcast. I don't know if that's because they can't get it anymore or you're not doing it anymore, but if you're not doing it, get back to doing it, and if you are doing it, folks, check it out. Check out History with Mark Bielski, his podcast. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, great seeing y'all. All right. Yep. Hopefully see you more often. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Preferably in another country. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, take care. Take care. Bye. Okay. Wow. Okay. The, the New Orleans has fallen and the Civil War, this Civil War episode uh, is over on History Happy Hour. Thanks. That was great to have Mark on there and to see Mark again. Um, and I want to just mention, as I said, I'm going to keep mentioning constantly that we are transitioning everybody to new Facebook and YouTube pages. It's a time of tumult. Tumult. Tumult, one of my favorite yeah, words. Like uh, and we are going to send out our first History Happy Hour newsletter later this week. So if you want to get that and you want to find out our innermost thoughts. No, we're not going to be doing that. <laughs> but if you want to know what's going on. Uh, I think they uh, figured that out already. Yeah, let us know. Uh, you know, you can just add your name. You can send us an email and say you want to add your name to the newsletter uh, uh, um, list and that uh, email is up on the ticker on the bottom of the screen. It's info at historyhappyhour.net. We will not be selling your email to anyone. We will not be putting you on this list unless you tell us it's okay. So, you know, it's up to you. Act Entirely. now. Supplies are, are completely unlimited. <laughs> See stores for details. That's right. Okay. So uh, that message is done, and Chris, we, we do, it turns out we do have a guest next week, uh, and so uh, tell us about our guest next week. Yes, uh, uh, well, um, I'm going to show you the cover of the book. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Because I can't pronounce his name very well, I'm sure I'll mess this up. Jonathan Petropoulos uh, is a professor of um, history, and he has written a really wonderful book about uh the man in charge of basically st looting France for art. Uh, we know an awful lot about Goering's art collection. I know I talk about it on the Band of Brothers trip sometimes. Uh, but uh, Petropoulos does a really wonderful job of talking about the system that the Nazis put in place to basically loot France. Um, and the one person that kind of heads up that operation, and what's very interesting I found in the book, is that he talks about years and years after the war, he got to know this man, and he was alarmed by how engaging he was and he found himself having to examine this person as a historian but becoming kind of attached to him and the book deals not only with what happened during the war but how he dealt with this strange relationship with this former high-ranking Nazi. Wow okay yeah. sounds really interesting and we hope you'll join us for that and for other upcoming shows uh, and uh, stay with us we, we promise not to take any weeks off between now and July 4th so we're with you. We're with you through the rest of the spring and into the summer. Hoorah. Thanks, everybody. Have a safe week. Be safe.